Welcome to Pottery Visited, episode 25. I'm Tori. And I'm Shay. Today we are covering chapter 7 of Chamber of Secrets, Mudbloods and Murmurs. Or, as we like to call it, Slytherins with Lamborghinis. Well, opening up the chapter, we just have Harry doing his best to avoid both Gildory Lockhart and Colin Creevy and Sam. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and uh, jumping into their classes, Ron's wand is just getting worse and worse, which we talked about last episode about the liability and the how dangerous it is. But in their charms class, it actually like flies out of his hands and hits Professor Flitwick in the face. And then he gets this like boil coming up on his forehead. So he's literally injured and still no one's doing anything about this wand. Oh, yeah. It's, I mean, again, the gross negligence at Hogwarts is ridiculous. He's a danger to himself. He's a danger to others. And he can't learn properly without a better wand. So yeah, poor Ron. Hogwarts just does not do what needs to be done to ensure the success and safety of its kids yeah honestly it's kind of a blessing that ron didn't have to do his exams with this wand yeah he would have been doomed he would have failed yeah honestly you can't do anything if i would have like blown up the school yeah oliver wood wakes harry up in like dawn to go for quidditch practice and my whole thing is i, I get oliver is like the personification of a jock and all he thinks about is quidditch he lives and breathes quidditch we get it okay but the thing is like why didn't he tell anyone? It seems like it was very last minute. Like he booked the pitch, obviously. So he had that forethought, but he didn't tell any of the team members Yeah, that the practice was going to be that morning. Yeah. Maybe he thought they would complain if he told them at night when they were like fully calm, like psychologically there. And he thought in the morning when they're drowsy and have no idea what's happening, it'll be easier to like shove them into it, you know, because they won't have enough energy to argue. Or maybe he filled out like the booking of the pitch form late at night and everyone was already in bed sneaky but it just like i just feel like why would he like he planned everything except for telling his team and then the fact that there's alicia angelina and katie who were girls on the team and oliver can't go up to their dormitory so how did he wake them up <laughs> Maybe he like threw things at the door to the girls' dormitory and shouted. Or like maybe there's one or two Gryffindor girls that just wake up early and he's like, you need to go in there and get them out of bed. It just feels like Oliver is so like organized when it comes to Quidditch. And it's just like why he did everything so on the book except for like making sure the team was like aware of their practice. <laughs> but anyways, I don't know what Oliver's doing, but you know. Moving on, uh, Colin apparently has great sense of hearing and has hairy senses because he hears Harry's name being like called on, on like the staircase, and so he races out to go see what Harry's doing. Yeah, I find that so annoying. Like, I'm so happy I'm not interesting enough for anyone to ever want to follow me around with a camera because, like, especially at age twelve, when you don't have a lot of like forethought I, i'm surprised harry doesn't just flip out on him all the time i'd be like stop following me it's weird and creepy i'm trying to live my life yeah we do get how frustrated harry is with colin but he's still too polite to tell him off because i feel like if this is anyone else like ron or any one that grew up semi-normally they'd be like okay you need to bugger off like I'm, I'm not dealing with you yeah especially first thing in the morning like listen you're in the same house as me we get to talk to each other and catch up once in a while and that's great but you don't need to act like I'm a celebrity. <laughs> so Colin actually shows Harry the photographs he got developed of him and Lockhart. And I find it really interesting because basically the photographs seem to personify like the personalities of Harry and Lockhart. So Lockhart's like grinning at the camera, really hamming it up. And Harry's like trying to get away from him and like not be in the photograph, which is perfect. <laughs> yeah, I uh, have a couple different like theories about the photographs. One being that like, it sort of encapsulates your personality when they take the photo of you. So that f image of you also has your personality. But another one would be that like, it just encapsulates you as you are in that exact moment. So like the only real like personality or emotion it has is what would have been visible on the person in that moment. So like Harry wanted nothing more than to not be there. So that's his picture's number one priority sort of. And if they took a picture of him one day when he was really hungry, maybe that Harry in the picture just is constantly trying to find food. Like, But then when it comes to portraiture, everyone who's magical and has a portrait painted, the picture moves and the person, the image of themselves can move from portrait of them to portrait of them. 
But then my concern is if you're really famous and there's a lot of portraits of you, are there some that just see you once in your entire life and then you never return to that portrait because you have so many places to be? And then also if there's a portrait of you done when you're an adult versus a portrait of you when you're a baby, it's not the same image of you. So does that baby image of you have the right to go between all your other portraits or just all other portraits of you taken at that age? Yeah, it's very confusing. Yeah, the actual like logic behind how portraits and photos work in in the wizarding world just doesn't fully feel believable to me i guess i feel like we are are told that like the portraits are like a like a echo of like who they are because we have the portraits in the headmaster office that like dumbledore talks to and stuff and they talk to harry and everything but they're not like actually like i don't know like real humans it's just like they're just an imitation of like their previous life so they kind of like have the personality of their previous like of who they were but they're not like the actual person yeah it just seems strange sort of the the movement from picture to picture really throws me and the age I guess like how do you it would be weird to have baby photos of Harry but now when he goes and looks at them there's no Harry in the photo or no Harry in the painting or whatever and then all of a sudden grown Harry's in the painting because grown Harry wanted to come from his picture from grade seven to come hang out with it's just it bothers me the logic behind it seems kind of flimsy yeah it's cool and like on the surface but when you get into how it actually works it's kind of confusing yeah it just wasn't like they didn't go into it in depth enough for us to have like a believability kind of like as soon as you think about it beyond that's neat it kind of falls apart as a concept they really would have had to like do a bit more explaining of sort of the magic behind it and the concept for it to make any sense sort of beyond just surface level i'm sure we'll talk about it more like next book when we have like sir cardigan and the more of the portraits moving in between each other mm-hmm. and we can kind of get more of an idea of how it works but yeah it's just i remember i we haven't really experienced it too much yet the interesting idea is that like the portraits and photographs although they're both different they both kind of are like a reflection of like their real life counterparts yeah so interesting yeah interesting enough um we get kind of like a rehash on quidditch as like a lot of the earlier books they kind of um rehash a lot of like concepts from the first few books just to kind of remind you what what everything is so we instead of um wood explaining to harry what quidditch is, we, we have uh harry explain to colin what quidditch is and like the rules and like how it's played and although harry is kind of exasperated telling him and he's just like kind of like so over it like i think it's, it's pretty important for like the muggleborns to like know how the sports played because it's like a huge deal in the wizarding world and i feel like no one really explains it to them like harry's only told about quidditch because he becomes friends of Ron, who's a pureblood wizard who who grew up with it. And then he gets he magically gets on the team. And so then he has like a person on the team explaining it to him. But if like you're not joining the team as a first year, which most aren't, because I don't even think they're not they're supposed to try out. Like how are you supposed to learn anything unless you have a friend that's grown up with it? I mean, I kind of see it as like similar to people who like move to Canada from abroad and how hockey is here or like you might not know the rules because I mean some countries pay attention to hockey but it is not exactly the most popular sport in the world so people will come here and they won't know anything about it but just by like interacting with your coworkers and your friends you get to know a little bit about it and it's in the background when you guys go out to dinner at like a pub and like you start to learn about it just through interacting with people who know about it like it's sort of a part of the culture so you just get a bit of an understanding that way and I feel like the same thing would happen to all the muggleborns like they'd have someone in their house talking about their favorite quidditch team they'd learn a little bit here and a little bit there and they might not know like the quidditch equivalent of an offside or things like that but they'd understand like the basics of it just from it being so important and prevalent yeah it just kind of made me think that a lot of this chapter is about wizarding society and kind of made you think about how muggleborns are kind of kept out of it so just one more thing that they're not aware of that it just seems like there's no effort to like yeah catch them up on anything so they're they're still outsiders on this one thing but you know i was also wondering of of magical if like we know that this is like their sport like how canada is known for hockey but in general, we have tons of sports around the world and it's all different. So I'm wondering, like, is this the only wizarding sport or do they have more, but they just aren't as popular? Well, they have like wizard's chess and like gobstones, which aren't exactly sports. But you have to assume there's like some other wizard sports or maybe even like muggle sports that have a bit of a magical spin on them. I, I just think like this is the biggest one. I'm sure there's other sports just 
The answer to that is sports. I just think that they probably don't take precedence compared to this one. Like we grew up playing hockey because that's just like what you do in Canada. But like in the US, like baseball and basketball are way bigger than they are here. I think like a good way to think of it is like when I think of our high school, we had a hockey team, but we didn't have like a football team team that went out and played football against other schools or whatever so like I think it's maybe just like uh that's the sport that the most people are interested in there and that's the sport that has historically been done there so that's the one that's like prevalent yeah like maybe they have a soccer team we don't know maybe the Hogwarts soccer team goes out and plays against the Durmstrang soccer team every couple of months and we just don't hear about it because None of our main characters are on that team. So basically, uh, Wood takes them into the changing room, which is how Harry loses Colin, which he's happy about. But then Wood drones on about his new plan where everyone's like half asleep and he gets really frustrated. But, you know, what was he expecting? Just like kind of surprising them with a practice. Yeah, I feel like he is so enthusiastic about it and so invested and it's such the top priority in his existence. He forgets it's not necessarily the top priority in everyone else's. So he's like, I'd be so happy to start the day early with Quidditch and like the great way to open your mind up and wake up in the morning is thinking about Quidditch. Well, yeah, he says that he spent the whole summer working on this new strategy. So like he's obviously like he's a really great captain, but like he's a big nerd. (laughs) I think that they, a lot of them kind of tell him off for like, okay, you're taking it too seriously. But I can understand for him that it's like Quidditch is his priority. Like, what does he want to do when he grows up? He wants to be a professional Quidditch player. It's sort of, so it's his future career. It's kind of schoolish for him. Like, it's his top priority. And it's hard for someone whose number one priority is so clear to them to understand how other people don't prioritize the same thing, you know? Like, he maybe doesn't realize this isn't the most important thing at school for everyone else. This isn't the future career path of everyone else. Some people are there to have a good time. Yeah, this is just the first week of school. Like, it's the first weekend at school, and he's already getting in there. I mean, for some of them, it's like, I'm pretty good at Quidditch, and they're viewing it like intramurals. You play against other kids at your school. And then Oliver Wood is like, this is me auditioning for the Olympics. <laughs> like... <laughs> Yeah. Well, one thing I did notice is that when they finally get out to actually start practicing, Ron and Hermione are waiting or like out there watching with their clear breakfast. And I'm realizing that they didn't even have breakfast yet. Yeah. So it just doesn't seem like appropriate for them to be doing a like a practice and using all this energy when they haven't even eaten. I would be so grumpy. I would be so grumpy. Like maybe if I just had a cup of coffee, I could function for an hour or two. But like, I would be so grouchy. Like, there should be fruit he should have Oliver Wood as a captain should have brought some like fruit and toast down to the change room for them during his speech you know that would have been good coach move he's just starving them like they're running on fumes like no wonder they're falling asleep while he's talking like it's probably they probably got them off at like 4 a.m and they're tired and they're hungry and they're starting practice at like 7 a.m and now there's diagrams yeah (laughs) basically at this point um they're about to practice there was a few distractions of Colin taking pictures, and then the Slytherin Quidditch team comes onto the pitch, which really pisses Wood off because, you know, he booked the pitch and everything, and he got his teammates all up, and they're just about to start. And I, comparing the teams, um, Harry notes that the Slytherin Quidditch team has, it's just all boys, there's no girls on the team, which is interesting because in Muggle Quidditch, they have that co-ed rule where you you can only have, um, you have to have equal number-ish of um genders on the team like on play so you can't have like all boys playing like or all girls playing you have to have like i think it's like you can only have like four i think of the same gender at a time yeah i mean it could just be that like slytherin dudes are a little more like douchebaggy and a little more uh sexist i also think if we look at like just the play styles of the teams the gryffindor team seems like they place a lot of emphasis on like speed and and like finer detailing sort of and finesse Uh, But in the case of Slytherin, every time we read about their gameplay, it's a lot of, like, aggression. Like, they're a very physical team. And if you're building your team specifically for it to hurt when you hit people, you're going to pick the bigger people. And that's probably going to end up being mostly dudes. Um, So I feel like they picked the biggest people they could find to blatantly abuse and hurt the opposition rather than picking like based on skill level and if that's the style of play a team has even if like say me as a Slytherin if I were good at Quidditch I wouldn't be the right choice for that team even if I was good at it because like that wouldn't be how I played it's just the play style they have also they're dicks probably but definitely play style wise interesting 
Yeah. I think it's also interesting to see like how Snape is not really the coach of the team, but he's like the head of the house and like, how he, his team is picked versus how McGonagall picks her team. Because we know McGonagall has Quidditch background. Yeah. I don't think they pick the teams either, though. The captain picks the teams. I know. We know McGonagall is pretty involved with the Gryffindor team, but that could just be, be because she's competitive and also she played Quidditch, so she cares about it a lot. Yeah. I think Snape is busy. He likes to see Gryffindor lose. He likes to see Slytherin win, but he's not going to spend time on it. I like he likes the attention. Like he likes having like the the superiority be like being at, at, like as long ahead of it. But I don't think he plays like as much attention to it as McGonagall does. But they are very much both competitive about it because we know we hear things McGonagall says about Snape and the Quidditch Cup. So she's she's very interested in it. It is her passion. So we find out that uh, Snape has given the Qu- Slytherin Quidditch team permission over going over Oliver so they can train their new seeker, which I think sucks because Snape just should have waited because Oliver already did all the work to book the pitch. Even if he didn't tell his teammates, he still went through the process. And I just feel like it's kind of shitty for Snape just to like overrule it because they could have trained Draco any other time. But it's just because it's the Gryffindor team. Yeah, absolutely. He's like, actually, train Draco now. (laughs) Well, I wonder whose idea it was. I wonder if they came like, hey, we need the pitch at some point to train our new seeker. And he was like, oh, Gryffindor has it booked. Let's just override that. (laughs) Or if they looked at the thing, saw Gryffindor had it and was like, how much better would it be for us to not only train our seeker, but prevent them from training theirs? Let's ask him if he can override it. Either way, Snape had to, Snape had to approve it. So... He had to prove it for sure, which I think McGonagall might have very likely have done the same thing in her. If they were like, Slytherin's training, but we need to train our new whatever. McGonagall would be like, screw them, Slytherin Quidditch kids. Like, I think in a lot of things, McGonagall would be more fair. But in Quidditch, I think she would have done the same thing. Well, we see that. But either way, one point for Snape sucking. (laughs) So we've kind of spoiled it. But of course, the new... Seeker for Slytherin is Malfoy. And how did this happen? We wonder, but we do find out that Lucius Malfoy has mysteriously bought the entire Quidditch team new brooms. High-end designer luxury brooms. And what is the rules around this? Because we talked about this when McGonagall or got Harry's broom and we don't know how if she paid for it or if the school paid for it. So what are the rules around this? Because this seems so shady. Like it's one thing to buy Harry a broom, but now you have a, buying a parent buying his son, basically what Hermione says, buying his way onto the team by getting the whole team like state-of-the-art brooms. I mean, I guess it's like the, the school can only control so much. Like they have school brooms for if kids don't have brooms that make the team. But if a parent buys their child a broom, they can't say, no, your kid can't use their good broom. And I guess because him gifting it to them really is sort of outside of like their purview kind of. They couldn't say, don't gift these kids brooms because like every kid wants a cool broom. It'd be a dick move. Yeah. It's definitely a gray area, but I feel like there should be something around it. It's shady for sure. I think that's one of the hard things when it comes to, like, quality of equipment in sports. Like, it's it has a significant, significant role in, like, the quality of play. So I definitely see how it's, like, unfair. I feel like the best thing for, like, a school team to do would almost be to, like, have a a list of pre-approved brooms that are allowed to exist in this, like, league or during school tournaments where, like, you can have brooms from, like, the Comet... 34 to the firebolt 2 or whatever and they're all accepted so at least the brooms are somewhat in the same range it's scary if like someone's driving a 75 year old whatever and someone's on a new lamborghini broom well kind of reminds you of like the classes and like almost like like the wealth disparity in sports because it's very a big thing about like how like to be good at sports like it's just like the money and a lot of people can't afford it and like also especially in the uk the the class system like there were games that were for people in the poorer area and then there was the wealthy people games and so i don't really know where quidditch falls but it definitely seems like malfoy's able to afford the best so obviously he can get on the team and he notes like how poor, how like not great the Weasleys brooms are and like the rest of the team. Like Harry has the better broom on that team. I think it's funny that the thing they got are brooms that make them faster because as I mentioned before, the Slytherin team was not chosen to be quick, to be speedy, to make sharp turns. They were chosen for like bulk sort of, like they're chosen to be large and broad and aggressive. And it's weird to like choose the fastest brooms, but then like the slowest flyers. 
kind of like it, it might make them a little bit faster which is good but also like it's like they're trying to slightly improve their weakness rather than like focus on their strength like it feels like maybe there's better ways to do it like that's not a good the most clever way of manipulating the game and taking advantage of your strengths yeah i just don't like i don't know i feel like they could have done something better i just think it shows malfoy's jealousies like he we know he spent like the summer complaining about harry potter to his father yeah and one of the things was he's on the quidditch team and he's not even good well now draco's like you know what i need to get in the team but we know draco's like a really good flyer He's been flying for years. We learned in the last book. So I don't know why he just didn't trust himself to get on the team. So obviously, instead of like relying on his own like skills, he just got his dad to use his like prestige or his money to kind of like convince the team to let him on. Yeah. Well, failure is really, really scary. And I feel like Draco has a very, very fragile self-esteem. Like he acts like he thinks he's the greatest, but I think he's really insecure all the time. And I think the, I don't think he would have tried out for the Slytherin Quidditch team if he wasn't guaranteed the outcome he wanted. Because I don't think he could handle trying out and then not getting on. You know what I mean? So I think in order for him to bother trying, he needed to know the outcome because he just couldn't handle the rejection. So I feel like he was like, I'm good enough to make the team, but also just in case I'm going to make sure I make the team because he just doesn't have the ability to handle that rejection. And I'm also wondering, what was in it for Lucius to get the brooms for them? Because I feel like Lucius, like, he obviously, he loves his son in his own way, but I feel like Lucius doesn't do things for Draco unless it benefits him. Yeah, I can think of a couple ways. One would be maybe some of the uh, Slytherin kids' parents are Death Eaters, and so helping the kid makes gets him in better with the parents. Uh, another thing could just be his status. Like every time Draco succeeds and does something well, the family looks good. So getting Draco on the team and having Draco play well benefits his sort of how he's viewed publicly. And it's just money kind of to the Malfoys. Like they have so much of it. It's kind of like, okay, I'll spend the equivalent of $10 to a normal person to make my kid look good. Yeah. It's all about perception for those Malfoys. Well, Malfoy basically tells them that the rooms suck and whatever. And the team's kind of just like flabbergasted at like how all the Slytherins have these amazing rooms and like, what are they going to do? And her mind just rolls up. She just knows. She's like, you know what, Malfoy? At least no one had to buy their way in. Oh my God, what a badass. Yeah, she literally punches him right in the insecurities. Like she finds that little spot and she hits it so hard. We well, you know how insecure Malfoy is about like everything. And she just was, she, no one knows what to say. And Hermione doesn't even care about Quidditch or brooms or anything. And she's just like, you know what? He eats shit, basically. <laughs> <laughs> Malfoy is just so, he doesn't even know anything decent comeback to say. So he just says a slur, basically. Like literally his comeback to being pointed out his own flaws, his own insecurities, and his nepotism. Then his only reply is also racist. <laughs> Pretty much. You have that it looks like uh, Fred and George were going to beat Draco up. Yeah, they like re- physically restrain them. And I'm like, I kind of want to see it. Like, I- I'd like to see Fred and George beat up Draco. I mean, it does happen later on in the series. I do wish that scene in Order of the Phoenix could have been in the movie. We didn't get any quidditch in Order of the Phoenix, which is, which is kind of sad. But just the idea of like, just to see the see Malfoy almost getting what was coming to him. I would like to see a bit more of Malfoy getting his comeuppance. I mean, he's a kid. He's an asshole kid. But like, I was a kid when I read it and I wanted him to get his comeuppance. I just want to point out that Ron's first um, instinct was to curse Malfoy on Hermione's behalf, which just shows the guy is. Because I know a lot of fandom, there's a lot of like Ron haters in like the general fandom, which I remember being a kid and not understanding this. Yeah, I still don't get it. He's not perfect. He's not supposed to be. Yeah, and his first instinct is to stick up for his friends. And so obviously it doesn't work out, but like that's his first instinct is just like to, he needs to defend his friend. And yeah, and it's not a good choice and it's very poorly thought out, but it's exactly what you'd want him to do kind of, you know? Let's well, very Gryffindor for Ron. Ron's just like, Ron and Ray are both like act first, like think later, where Hermione's the opposite. Yeah. But like all, it's always in like with the best intentions. Like Ron doesn't know really how to get a, like Ron's the only one too because Harry and Ryan don't know what's going on but Ron is really the only one out of the three of them that knows like what that word means and like the context of it and yeah he's sticking up for Hermione what I think is interesting is that the twins and Ron raised in the same household the same degree of like being pure blood but being in a family that really accepts muggles 
Ron's first reaction is the magical response. Like, I must hurt them using my magic. But the twins both immediately go for, like, a physical altercation, like, punching and kicking. And I wonder what that says. It's just about, like, the underlying sort of psychology and personality of them all. Like, I feel like Ron's first response is, I'm going to do magic because that what that's what could like hurt Draco the most kind of like that's what will be the most effective against him and the twins have this physical response because I feel like physical altercations are more like emotionally relieving of your anger like there's more to it the twins aren't usually violent but I feel like they are in Quidditch mode and they are beaters like they're probably in one of the most aggressive roles in Quidditch which is probably how they release a lot of their anger because we don't really see them get physically angry a lot it's more Ron and when they do it's the right people that they're angry at most of the time yeah it, when it does happen it's like the right people like they only really get physically angry a few times in the series but I just feel like they're in Quidditch mode and I don't actually know if like they carry their wands when they're in like their Quidditch gear I also wonder if like maybe it's like a thing where, like, there's two of them and they're both years ahead of Malfoy. So, like, the things they could do to him with magic, he has no chance to defend. But, like, they're semi-fair, balanced physically when it comes to the fact that Malfoy has a whole Quidditch team that's pretty bulky behind him. So, like, maybe it's a little bit like they want to fight, but they want a fair fight. And them using magic on Draco Malfoy is not fair. But them punching him when he's got a whole squad there is more fair. Yeah. Interesting about the twins, but um, so Ron spell obviously backfires because of his broken wand, which hasn't been fixed because logic. Instead of Malfoy throwing up slugs, get Ron throwing up slugs, which is sad because Malfoy deserved to eat slugs. He totally deserves to eat slugs. And so Harry and Hermione decide that they're going to bring him to Hagrid's, and Colin ends up coming down, and Ron's clearly ill, throwing up slugs, and. Like, Colin asks Harry to hold him still so he can get a picture. And I'm just like, where is your, like, common decency? Like, I get he's a kid and he's excited and he probably doesn't understand, like, magic being bad yet. Yeah. Because it's all so exciting. But I'm just like, the, just, like, he can't read the room. Who wants a picture of someone throwing up anything at all? Let alone slugs specifically? Like, I just think it's just like, I just feel like he's very excited by magic because it's still so new. He's only been there for a week. And he, it's just like, he wants a picture of everything. But I just feel like... Everyone was obviously worried about him besides, like, the Slytherins. Yeah, he's unwell. He was attacked with a curse. But, and, like, obviously they're they're taking him away. And he's just, like, his third spot was, like, actually, hold him still. I want a picture. I mean, that's also a little bit Gryffindor, though. His top priority isn't the well-being of someone else. It's, like, this is exciting, and I want to remember the exciting. I also think, in my mind, it's it's kind of a very only sibling thing to do. Like, if you're a sibling, you get used to the fact that, like, sometimes bad things happen to your siblings that are interesting, but... You'll suffer if you enjoy it at all. We do know Colin does have a brother, though. I know, which is why I think, I know it's weird and it's like a small thing, but I feel like at this time he was written as an only child and they added in a sibling later because this behavior is very like, like if your sibling is suffering and you laugh or you take a picture or you enjoy it in any way, it'll come back to haunt you so soon after that you learn real early on, even if you don't feel particularly empathetic for just like self-serving purposes, you know, to like not get involved or certainly not show any signs of joy so I feel like it feels so only child to me I feel like the sibling was written in after this had happened already in canon yeah we have to look into that when uh Dennis is introducing Goblet of Fire I've heard some things about Goblet of Fire but it being like the weakest uh book and there's a lot of plot holes so once we get to it we'll have to go with a fine tooth comb Ooh, zesty but anyways uh Ron is throwing up slugs they get caught out of the way and they're going to Hagrid's hut, which was their plan the whole day. But before they can go into Hagrid's hut, Lockhart comes out and Harry's like, nope, screw Ron. We are hiding <laughs> in a bush. Oh, heck no. So Lockhart came to turn out just to, you know, like, make Hagrid think he was amazing. And Hagrid's just like, hell no. Which is really funny because Hagrid worships the ground Dumbledore walks on. <laughs> but yeah, but this guy, he's like, mm. I don't know. No, he's fake. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Ron and Hagrid are the ones that are like, nope, he didn't do any of that stuff. It's all bullshit. It's Ron and Hagrid of all people that are like really in tune to it. And I get that because Ron is very in tune to feelings, but it's pretty funny that Hagrid and Ron, no one would expect those two to be the most uh, on top of something. Yeah, well, Hermione actually questions Hagrid because um, he kind of, Harry, he kind of says that Lockhart's just full of shit and whatever. And Harry's even surprised that Hagrid's saying this stuff because Hagrid's always been very much on the professor's side, has a lot of respect for the professors, even the last book where they're all like, it's Snape, it's Snape. Or 
then it's Quirrell. He was he still wouldn't hear anything bad about Snape because he was a professor. We know that Hagrid doesn't really like Snape, but he's like he's a professor, so he's like he has he's like he deserves respect. But Lockhart, he's like that guy. What a hack! I also um, I love that when complimenting Hermione, Hagrid says our Hermione. So not only does he compliment her for being smart and knowing how to do all the spells, but he like reinstates and reminds that they're their own little family in a way and she's a valued part of it. And it's so sweet. It's it- I feel like it really kind of connects Hermione to the trio because like last, I feel like the last book, like she was a, a like a later added edition. Mm-hmm. So I feel like we get really get Harry and Ron's bond in the first book like book yeah but this one kind of like really cements how much Hermione needs to them I think this also this book in general kind of shows how much Hermione needs to them because when they lose her it's very apparent like how much they rely on her yeah but um we have Ron defending her as he would Harry and then we have her her, like Hagrid including Hermione in like their little group which is like really sweet us our Hermione like it's it's very soft I also think it's kind of heartbreaking how even Hagrid is a little mean to poor Neville. <laughs> poor Neville. Like, I don't know if Neville wasn't there, but he's like, I mean, Neville's pure blood and he's an idiot. Like, poor Neville. How dare you? How dare you, Hagrid? You can compliment Hermione without insulting Neville. Yes, yeah, so according, we get this tidbit from Hagrid that according to him, Lockhart was the only person who applied for the dark arts job, which is why he was hired, because no one else applied for it, because it's jinxed, which is kind of foreshadowing later in the book when we find out that the job was actually jinxed. <laughs> I don't know if that's true. Like, I feel like a lot of people probably apply, even if it's probably deadly, because that's such a cool job. Like, that's such a cool job. I feel like... Well, you know, Hagrid's probably getting this from Dumbledore. And as we know... And Dumbledore doesn't want to have to justify why he chose Lockhart. So he's probably pretending no one else applied. So he doesn't look like an idiot for hiring the guy. Meanwhile, he probably rejected some perfectly fine teachers. As we know, Dumbledore would rather hire someone who uh, that goes along with his plan for Harry than actually hiring an appropriate teacher for the entire school. Yeah. What an asshole. Ron explains to Harry and Hermione, like, why the word mudblood is, like, bad and, like, the context of it in Wizarding Society. And we get this whole speech in the movie, but we get it from Hermione. And I just find it so refreshing, because I haven't read this book in a while, but it's so refreshing hearing it come from Ron, because it just makes so much more sense coming from him. Because Ron grew up as a wizard. He lived from it. Like, it doesn't really make... Like, I get Hermione in the movies. It's just the one that knows everything. So that's why they give this to her. And it's kind of, like, her emotional moment and everything. But, like, it makes sense coming from Ron. And it just kind of... I think it kind of creates better bond, because the, the whole reason why he's defending Hermione is because he knows that she belongs here and stuff and he's defending her like right to belong in this world absolutely and like i think it's 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 an example of like how they just smart washed the movies for hermione they're like anything that's a smart moment or i know a thing goes to hermione which is again the complete disservice to ron who knows a lot about the wizarding world and that's his area of smart and they couldn't even give him something that's entirely in his wheelhouse of being intelligent has no reason for Hermione to really know it at this point and they still gave it to Hermione like it's almost to the detriment of the story they gave Hermione that factoid and it's like when we all know the conspiracy that the screenwriter for the Harry Potter movies liked Hermione as his favorite character and he just decided you know what everything goes to her yeah it's frustrating that's one of the more frustrating ones I think because it makes sense that Ron knows that. It makes sense for the whole sort of storyline. And Hermione should, like, Hermione's done a lot of research on wizarding things. I'm sure she's read a lot of books. But I feel like the books she read are, like, textbooks, spell work, history of magic, like, ancient history of magic. I can't see her reading, like, a current events or, like, uh, social justice in the wizarding world. Like, it's not the type of book she would pick, choose to pick up. So there, I can't see where she would have come across, like, a term like that yeah it's just like not something you can really learn in a book which is like why it makes sense for her wanting to learn like theory and like history but you can't really learn like social context it's what you live it like ron does and hermione would never really really come across it in a book because like he said it's not something like you hear in like civilized society it's just like the backwards bad part of society yeah and it also is a detriment to ron in that him not saying it in the movie almost implies that he doesn't know that which would be very ignorant of him like as a pure blood wizard whose family is wizards and who's lived in the wizarding world like you'd think you you should you ought to educate yourself on injustices 
I feel like they were really playing up Ron throwing slugs. So the reason why he wasn't saying anything in the movie is because they were making him throw up so many slugs for comedic effect. And he kind of chimes in a bit there. Let's talk about racism while throwing up slugs. They wanted to make it funny, but like, and I get they have this big, Emma has this big like emotional acting moment where she has like tears in her eyes and it's great and stuff. There's other things she could have cried about. Like after Ron tells her what it means. So Hagrid's growing some really big pumpkins. Yeah. Suspiciously big pumpkins. Very (laughs) suspicious. So he basically implies that he gave them some help. And Harry again says that he thinks that Hagrid has his wand hidden in his umbrella. Yeah. And I'm wondering, how did he get his wand? Like, we might have talked about this in our last book discussion. But did Dumbledore, like, help him get his wand? Because we know when you're expelled, your wand is snapped. Absolutely. And I'm assuming that they don't give you the pieces. So somehow Hagrid got the pieces and he's able to somehow. I feel like Dumbledore probably nabbed them. They probably snap the wand, think it's dead, and then throw it out. And Dumbledore was like, I can't fully fix a wand, because that's not how this works, but I could partially fix a wand. Or he just elder wanded the shit out of it and completely fixed it, and it's a totally functional wand. Yeah, he just told Hagrid that he's not supposed to use it unless, like, emergencies, or only when Dumbledore says he can. <laughs> yeah. Just use this for umbrella stuff. Casual umbrella No impressive magic, Hagrid. Real subtle, okay? Well, speaking of uh, Hagrid's wand being snapped, we get kind of a reference to Hagrid being expelled. Ooh, yeah. Which is a hint to come on later because Hagrid's... Juicy foreshadow. Yeah. Harry's like, he won't talk about it. I think it's interesting that Hagrid's been expelled and they haven't gotten inquired more about it, especially considering that Hermione thinks expulsion is worse than death. Yeah. Well, I think it's it's referenced that they, they have asked him because they said end time that they try and bring it up, he gl- goes silent and he changes the subject. So I feel like... But he really sucks at keeping secrets. So I'm surprised that they brought it up more than once and still don't know the answer because Hagrid's ability to not over talk. Well, I feel like they, they're empathetic kids and I feel like Hagrid's their friend. So I feel like they they're still curious and nosy as we know. So they probably brought up a few times when it, it's like relevant, like when they see that he's always using magic. They're like, well, why did you get expelled? But he won't say anything. And they know it's obviously probably really sad to him. So after a while, it's kind of like, if you, like there's your curiosity, but there's also like, if it's your friend, you feel bad, like making them want to talk about something they obviously don't want to talk about. I wonder if part of Hermione's sort of fear of expulsion is sort of seeing Hagrid's life because I feel like Hagrid really likes his life and it's a very cute I live on campus at school like I do with the animals but like it's very isolated he's not really surrounded by peers he's not really shown a lot of respect by people in his age group I wonder if like Hermione was always afraid of expulsion because it makes because it's not good but also I wonder if like seeing sort of how Hagrid lives for Hermione as a person who like has a bit of ambition and who loves knowledge I think maybe seeing that I think Hermione as a person I think hates the idea of failure because we know later on in the books like her greatest fear like for her ball guard is like failing her year so failure is obviously a big thing to her but I think also seeing Hagrid kind of outcasted like obviously Hagrid likes his life and he's very comfortable with his life and he's happy but to Hermione she he obviously probably seems like outcasted from wizarding society I mean he's hanging out with like yeah kids (laughs) yeah but to Hermione like she probably, ha- she says it's the first time she's probably had like really good friends and like a good life in the wizarding world. And if she is expelled, she'd have to go back to the muggle world and where she probably is an outcast. And so she's like, that's not an option to her. I mean, I think she probably gets on pretty well in the muggle world. She's very smart. I just think it'd be hard to go back after knowing, like experiencing Hogwarts is like, more the reason that she's like, okay, I definitely cannot get expelled. It's one thing being expelled in the muggle world and just going to another school, but she's like, having to leave all of this and going back to, like, what I previously did. I mean, if she's expelled from Hogwarts, she's not necessarily expelled from the wizarding world. I mean, you just don't get to continue your education, so there's a limit on how what you can do magic-wise. Because they snap your wand, so was could you just go to another wizarding school? No, I would say you can do magic that doesn't need a wand, you can do potioning, you can still do learning, and you can still, like, hang out with wizards, you know? Just everything that doesn't involve wands. So I think for me, Hermione, my guess, if Hermione got expelled, is she would finish her education as a muggle and go to like a fancy muggle school, but she would study something like biology or physics and write on it for the wizarding world. So she would look at like things muggles think are scientific anomalies or historical inaccuracies and knowing about the wizarding world, research to see the truth behind it and then like write articles for the wizarding world on like muggles think this, but it was actually this magic. 
Like, I feel like that's what she'd end up doing. Yeah. So uh, I noticed that Hermione um, obviously disapproves of Hagrid using his wand because it's illegal and he's not supposed to be doing it. Yeah, yeah. Follow the rules. But she is still very interested in his pumpkins and the magic he did, which reminds me that Hermione's like obviously someone who's very like, we talked about this with Hermione's relationship with Fred and George, but how she's very strict on the rules. But if it's good magic, she's willing to like bend a little. And we see this when Fred and George start their joke pro- like projects in Order of the Phoenix. Like she's been on them the whole book about like breaking the rules and testing on first years. But when she sees the magic third and she's like, actually, that's pretty cool. That's pretty advanced. I wonder how they did that. She's so curious. She like like her desire to learn is one of the only things that'll overpower her desire to follow the rules. And speaking of the Weasleys, we have Hagrid noting that Ginny was hanging around his pumpkins and you know wondering where harry was so <laughs> what she teases him about which is really funny yeah i wonder if like it's probably partially that she has a crush on harry and wants to see him but it's also probably like she doesn't know a lot of people she's just starting to make friends i think maybe a part of it is she just wants to be around the people she knows like i feel like she's probably homesick and ron is her brother and harry is her crush well ron's probably spoken about hagrid and like all like the fun stuff he does at hagrid's house so she's just it's only her first week so she's probably just exploring the grounds yeah she's probably there looking for i mean maybe harry a little but mostly like things that remind her of home which would be ron and for the summer harry and like she probably just wants to feel that you know not lonely and remember her family's still there if she needs them and well uh when they go back into the castle hopefully having lunch because i'm just figuring that harry hadn't hasn't eaten all day yeah i'm hungry just reading this chapter i'm like man they really need to eat something the things we think of when we're adults i probably would not have noticed this when i was reading it as a kid but i'm like they haven't eaten all day those poor kids but uh mcgonagall finds them and it's like okay time for your detentions consequences for your actions and hermione's just like yep you deserve it but uh, Ron's attention is basically cleaning all the trophies in the trophy room by hand, as in muggle, muggle, the muggle way, as he says. But Harry's attention is to answer, is help Lockhart answer his fan mail. <laughs> and I just like, this isn't fair. Like, obviously, they should be dope both doing something similar. Like, Harry should be cleaning, maybe not together, but he should be cleaning another room by hand, too. But Lockhart asks for him specifically, and it's like, who oversees, like, the detention punishments? Because I just feel like, obviously, it's not fair. Absolutely. I think, um, I mean, it probably comes down to the head of house. The head of house decides punishments, and maybe Filch had been like, hey, next time someone gets in trouble, I need help cleaning the trophies. And she's like, okay, I'll keep that in mind. And then Lockhart's like, I would love for Harry to spend time with me doing letters. And McGonagall in her mind is like, that would make Harry suffer so much. Not in like a cruel way, but in like a, maybe he'll learn a valuable lesson if he did this particularly unpleasant thing. And she's like, it won't physically harm him. It'll sure teach him a lesson. So I think maybe she was like, yes. And like, if he'd asked for round two or something, she might've been like, sure, yeah, they'll both hate that. But he asked for Harry and she's like, oh, that's awful. I wouldn't, you know, she's like, perfect, fantastic. Yes, you can have him. But I also think there's a chance that Dumbledore was involved because Dumbledore wants Harry to spend time with Lockhart and realize how terrible he is. I feel like anytime Harry, anything happens to Harry, McGonagall's just doing normal things. And he's like, actually, this needs to happen for Harry. Maybe Lockhart asked McGonagall, like, hey, can I have Harry? And she's like, I'm a chick with Dumbledore. And she's like, that's not cool, right? Dumbledore, that's too much. Is that too much? And Dumbledore's like, no, it's perfect. Totally send him to Lockhart. It'll be great. Like, that's not its tension. That's not proper. And he's like, actually, yeah, do it. <laughs> but anyway, so Harry spends uh, about four hours uh, addressing envelopes by hand. And I got I, I kind of want to take back what I said, but not being like a fair... It's, it's still tedious, because if you've ever written for hours, which I haven't done lately, but as a kid, I, I actually probably did envelope stuffing as one of my first jobs. But either way, uh, Harry's there for four hours. So obviously he's just like, I want to leave. I want to leave. It kind of reminds me when I was working like shift work at like a restaurant and you're just counting down. Yeah. Counting down those hours <laughs> until you can leave. And Harry hears like this voice and it chills him to the bone, this cold voice that's murmuring. <laughs> no. He asked Lockhart about it, but Lockhart's like, oh no, we I haven't heard anything. You're just drowsy because we've been here for four hours. Oh my gosh. Yeah, he's just very kind of shaken up about it. It's really weird. So he waits um, for Ron to come back from his attention to ask him about it. And Ron also thinks it's weird. And I just like, it kind of reiterates that Ron is the to-go person for like weird wizarding stuff happening. Yeah. 
Like, is this a normal wizard thing or a weird wizard thing? <laughs> I think it's funny because, like, I could almost imagine Lockhart just not hearing something that other people would hear because he has this constant, A, he's talking to Harry the whole time, and B, he has this internal monologue of, gosh, Lockhart, you're the best. You have the best hair, Lockhart. You have the best smile, Lockhart. So, like, I could see him not noticing something that doesn't pertain to him directly. You know, it's not about him, so he doesn't really cognitively access that information at all. We have another uh, foreshadowing moment. So Ron explains to Harry that he's had like the worst dungeon ever. He was throwing up slugs still and he threw them up all over this services to the school award that he spent hours he had to like reclean it a bunch of times. And that just happens to be the award that Tom Brill won. So lots of little uh, foreshadowing tidbits for this chapter. It's kind of nice to think that Ron threw up slugs all over one of Voldemort's best moments. Thanks for listening to this episode. If you have any comments or things you want to talk to us about, like the portraits, you can email us at potterrevisitedpodcast at gmail.com or you can follow us and message us on social media at potterrevisited and we'll be back next time to discuss chapter 8 of Chamber of Secrets, the death date party. Bye! Bye.